Welcome to In Her Words Podcast. I'm Renee Rossi. And I'm Gretchen McCourt. And we're the co-founders of Women in Entertainment. Gretchen, we got to interview two of our favorite ladies. Susan and Suzanne have been with us from the beginning. They are as much a part of Women in Entertainment as we are. So Susan and Suzanne are the co-founders of Resonate Entertainment, and they have worked on some of the most all-time incredible female-led films um, that have come out of Hollywood. Yeah, everything that you enjoy when you're sitting at home from the holiday to what women want, um, they're just so much fun and their stories are so informative, so inspiring. We know you're going to gain something from today's episode. Absolutely. And, you know, Susan and Suzanne have been great mentors to so many, you know, up and coming artists and creatives in the industry. Um, So we really feel that you'll take some incredible insight away from today. We hope you enjoy when we were recording intros for the podcast and we were said, you know, to record this one, we were like, Susan and Suzanne are as much a part of WIE as we are. We're talking to Susan and Suzanne. (laughs) They've been with us since day one. (laughs) You guys have, and you've been so generous and helped us with people and and helped us from that very first summit. And I was thinking about when, I don't know how you guys met, but we have a funny story. Yeah. And then you, us going to breakfast at that little place in Santa Monica with Susan. That was the first time I, I was, yeah, we, you guys are, are WIE. We're family. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, Susan and I met oh. at a pop-up on Melrose. Wait, Except what kind of we, pop-up? Hadn't we met at the economic summit in San Francisco? We may have. And then we like, I, we did. And then I saw you for the second time. We were at like a random, yeah. like Adrian Grenier was hosting like a pop-up on Melrose. Aren't for his you guys fancy. Some sustainable, Some sustainable thing that got weird. Thing. And <laughs> I ended up talking to Susan. And, I was and, so and relieved Lynn. to see you. <laughs> I was like, you and I, I remember just so sitting. weird. I don't understand it. And, and we were like, and then I got, people were like standing on things. And then you and I were like, this is cool. Like we're going <laughs> to go to the corner and talk. Let's for a just while. talk. Uh-huh. And it was you were at you had storefront at the time cuz I still I think I have your business card from storefront. I did. I still have my business card. Yeah. I like them. It was a good logo. It was a good it logo. It was a great logo. Yeah. Did you guys work together at storefront at all? No. no. We were not even really in touch. No, we had met should we tell the story? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. So, uh well you tell you you start cuz it okay. really originates with you. So, um I developed what women want from basically a one-line pitch. Um, I It was brought to me by an executive at the company where I worked named Melissa Goddard with these two young writers, Yespa and Goldsmith, who've gone on to run shows like The King of Queens. They're brilliant. And um, the other thing that was fun about them is they had palpable chemistry but were not a couple. They're married now. But anyway. (laughs) Did you know at the time? You knew. (laughs) But anyway, it started as a one-line pitch and turned into a full-on movie. And along the way, our executive at Disney um, said, you know, Nancy Myers would do a great job on this. She was brought on board to write and, and possibly to direct if she wanted to direct. Turned out she wanted to direct. And so um, I gave her a couple of series of notes still no Suzanne. And then um, we're in production. We got Mel Gibson to star in it. Um, Disney didn't want to do it, but um, Paramount did. Sherry Lansing did. So we're making the movie at Paramount. And I discover that I can't get Nancy to make decisions on certain actors. So I was in touch with Suzanne because she'd worked for her for so many years. So I said, I really want to get Alan Alda into this movie. I know Nancy likes him, but we haven't quite nailed it. This is what I think we should do. What do you think? And she said, yeah, do that, but do this and this and this. (laughs) And sure enough, Nancy said, yes, she did all those things. We got Alan Alda and she was very generous. And, but I, I never really saw her because she was nine months pregnant with her daughter, who's now 23, graduated from college. (laughs) So it was sort of like Charlie and Charlie's Angels giving me instructions. (laughs) Just a little box and (laughs) Suzanne's voice would just come over. Exactly, exactly. So it started out, you know, just in such a congenial way. It was so nice. And um, she was so generous with information. And I think it made the whole process of the movie work better. So... And I have no idea what I said, but, uh, you know, I'm glad I was helpful. And and we, um, we, uh, yeah, and then I, uh, a couple of years later, um, went on to run Nancy's company at Sony. She was after What Women Want was such a massive success. Um, 
still to this day the second highest grossing romantic comedy of all time. It's pretty amazing. Yay, Susan. <laughs> Shaw. I love these outfits in that movie, matching the shoes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's amazing, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, then Nancy got a deal at Sony, and um, and Kate, my daughter, was almost two at that point, and she said, "Are you ready to come back to work? And would you like to run the company?" And I said, "I said I'd love that." And so that's what that's how that started. But Susan and I didn't speak. For, I mean, we stayed Facebook friends, and we became you know sort of um, friendly like that. But then we couldn't come back together for years. It was probably fifteen years later. Yeah, yeah. I got a call out of the blue from Suzanne. And she had decided she had this passion project she wanted to get made. It was not a Nancy kind of movie, but it was something she loved, a book that she loved. And I knew that Susan had had a lot of success um, producing adaptations of books. And so she just, and I just, I don't know, I just had this weird feeling she would get it. And like, what it. was it? Carrie Pilby. Oh. Of <laughs> so I called Susan and said, would you join me? Because I don't know how to make an independent film. And she knew a little more than I did, although we both came from the studio world, but she had, you had branched out at that point and yeah. knew a lot more than I did. And so we came together and through a very, you know, clever and creative process, I would say we, we sort of cobbled together the money and, and, and made that movie together. And that was the formation of Resonate. No, no. Um, well, yeah, yes. And no, it was the thing that sort of sparked it for about, um, six or seven years, I'd been pounding the pavement, trying to get people to invest in a film fund that was specifically for female focused projects. And it was just me doing it. And I'd have to take time off for, you know, four months, six months at a time to produce a movie. First, yeah. it was Aquamarine. Then it was, uh, it was middle the school, Duff. the Duff, um, all these things that I had to do to keep the lights on in yeah. my very, very small company it was <laughs> an assistant plus me. And, um, and I realized that I couldn't do it alone. I was interesting investors, but I couldn't get them to invest, um, at least not sufficiently to develop a slate. And the experience of working on Carrie Pilby with Suzanne and our third partner, Brent Emery was so good. And we, we had disagreements, but we would always resolve them. In a, it was not easy. It was not no, an easy movie. It was, it was really tough. Yeah. Uh, at one point, I was working on middle school in Atlanta for CBS Films, and Suzanne was in New York, and investors had fallen out, and you were like, do I get on a plane to Istanbul where there could be an investor? <laughs> and there it turns out there was. <laughs> there was, yeah. And we're, we're like crying and laughing at the same time. I was working, um, I think it was uh, Tuesdays, no, Wednesdays through Sundays. And and Carrie Pilby was, gonna, was on a Monday, Monday through Friday. Friday. So on the two days that I was off, I was working on Carrie Pilby and on the phone nonstop. I would just like bring food in and just stay in the apartment and work on Carrie Pilby in Atlanta. Oh and gosh. it turned out we had a couple of investors in Atlanta. Yes. Yes. Um, who came to visit and yeah. who I was able to work with yeah. there. But it was grueling. It was hard. And a nail biter. <laughs> it was a nail biter. And we could have, you know, easily not gotten along, but that didn't happen. And I went, you know what? We're really good together, the three of us. And it feels good to be working with other people and not just be out there on my own. Plus, I liked having a sort of mixed gender group, but I liked being, uh, primarily female uh, owned, you know, yeah, in, in terms right. of thinking about a company. And so I showed them the business plan because I'd put together a really extensive business plan for this film yeah. fund, right? And um, Brent, who's really focused on finance finance and business and independent finance, he went crazy for it. So that made me feel really good. Um, both because of his expertise and because he's a guy. Yeah. He's very supportive, obviously very supportive of women. And then Suzanne was like, I'm in. And so we retailored the business plan to suit three people yeah. as opposed to just one, which was never a great idea. I just hadn't found the right, I'd found lots of advisors, but not the right partners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we, um, we talked to somebody who saw me speak at the Women in Entertainment, the first <laughs> Women in Entertainment seminar. Um, she was in the audience. Her name's Jahan Agrama, and she's the CEO of Harmony Gold. And um, 
her family owns the Harmony Gold um, building, and she was interested in being an investor. And we um, we'd met a couple of times for lunch before I joined forces with Brent and Suzanne. And I said, "Why don't I introduce you to Jihan? She's so such an interesting, special person. Yeah. She's raised money before. She wants to help us." So we went on a tour of Harmony Gold, and it came up as we're going through. We really need office space so we can be together on a daily basis. Yeah. Would you consider investing by lending us some office space? And that ended up being part of our agreement with her. So Amazing. because of women in entertainment, <laughs> we got our first office together and we remain there to this day. It's incredible too. Like I kept I remember in those days thinking we just kept showing up every day. You know, it was it was an office, it was a place to go to. So it was real, you know, yeah, and we kept right. coming and, and we it had was saw horses yeah. and a couple of planks from IKEA. Yeah. Yeah. And then we, you know, bring in our extra chairs. <laughs> patio <folding> chairs. chairs. <laughs> <laughs> we, patio, we did have patio. Did. I brought those white yes. plastic I have a four dollars from yeah. uh Lowe's. I drew a picture on the board. Still I do there. caricatures of the three of us. It's still, still, still up still there. I should probably spray it with hairspray so it doesn't never take it. Yeah. We've taken plenty of pictures yeah. of it. And little by little, we really moved in. Um, but we started to raise money and we raised a fund that allowed us to lock down the projects we had with options yeah. and to develop, to start to develop mm -hmm. in a very economical and very uh, scrappy way. Scrappy way. <laughs> we yeah. were pretty clever um, and not in an unethical way. We yeah. were just we made a little bit go a long yeah. way. Yeah. And we never sort of out uh, exceeded our financial capacity. We used the money really well. I feel really proud of that, don't you? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What a, let's talk about Carrie Pilby because I feel oh like gosh, that yes. is like, I worked with you guys on the publicity for that, mm -hmm. but in the development of that, like what did that look like for you guys? Because I feel like you you had a lot of challenges with that film at the beginning. It was hard. It was hard to raise the money. It was we, a Kickstarter, uh, no? We started, well, we thought, you know, we thought, how are we going to raise, we didn't want to, we wanted to own the script, um, you know, to have the most um, flexibility and, and um, autonomy. And how did it. the script come to you guys? I had fallen in love with the book when I was running Nancy's company at Sony, and it was too small for that company. But um, once I wasn't at that company more, I, I ended up optioning the book. And ultimately, we wanted to have as much control as we could in terms of, um, you know, controlling the material and controlling the script. So when Susan came on, we just as a producer, we decided the best thing to do was to start a Kickstarter campaign. Let yeah. me just say, part of the secret sauce to being a producer is knowing how to marry the right writer yeah. to the right material. If you do that and you also have intelligent notes that will be supportive mm and um, bring the script to fruition in a way that yeah. it feels like a movie, then you can very, very early in the process have a script that feels like a movie. And, um, you know, when they talk about development hell, that's often because it was the wrong pairing. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. the wrong writer for the wrong project. Yeah. And one of the things that I'd say Suzanne is really great at and I'll pat myself on the back and say, it's something I know how to do too. It's a spidey sense combined with years and years of experience. Yeah. Um, and also knowing the people involved mm -hmm. because people write books and people write scripts, kind of knowing where their passions and experience converge. Um, you know, if you can do that, you can be really successful and very economical too. Yeah. You know, it, right. scripts do not have to co cost uh, you know, billions of dollars to be made, but often in the studio process, they're very expensive and we're able to keep things a lot less. So, yeah. and in this case, you know, you identified Kara as the right person to do the script. We vetted her because she'd done a lot of um, rewrites and adaptations mm -hmm. and a couple of and she came back right, but she felt like the right person. And she was passionate about the book. She was passionate and was about she it. Had she had a first vision. Was she your first person or that you I interviewed? I think we met with maybe a few writers. But, she but was, it was, she was maybe, it? maybe one when or I two. When I came yeah. in, she was the choice. Yes. So nice. I kind of wanted to check her out because I was like coming into your yeah. midst. And I thought, oh, well, she seems like a good choice. Mm -hmm. And then when we engaged with her, the first draft of the script, you knew. It was great. We had a movie. Yeah, we had a movie. It was great. 
That's awesome. Yeah. And you and had then, an all-star cast too. Oh yeah. You had a phenomenal cast for that. Good. Because the script was great. Yeah. Yeah. We got lucky. We attracted Belle Powley and Nathan Lane, which was Remember yeah, what she incredible. said to us? What she was goes, that? every role isn't right for me, but this role. Who, Belle? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Belle Powley said lunch. that. She yeah. was. She was uh, uh, yeah. perfect for that. Yeah. yeah. This, she this was seems right for me. Yeah. She was right. And we sort of, she, she wasn't very well known at the time, mm -mm. But, but we made it work and we we cast more well-known people around her, Nathan Lane, Gabriel Byrne, mm -hmm. Jason Ritter, Vanessa. Bur Vanessa. But she um, had a lot of heat because she'd been in Diary of a Teenage Girl. That's right. She was she was kind of and come up. she yeah. was kind of yeah. the thing. Yeah. 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 But more most importantly, she was perfect for the role. She was perfect. Oh, for the part. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. When you guys have projects and that one and coming on, does it coming from a novel or coming from a, a script specifically written for a film? Do you do you hesitate if it's a novel because it's then that extra step? Do you pre have preferences or is it just if it's a good story, it's a good story? Well, I've worked a lot from books, yeah. and I love working from books because it's inspiring to a screenwriter, and it gives them a lot of information and uh, character and story, and it's just a fantastic way to work. And um, distributors and marketers love, love it, it. Oh, because yeah. it's, it's – um, they call it IP, but yeah. it's, it's – yeah. It's 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 another way that the mm -hmm. audience has experienced the mm -hmm. story exposure yeah, yeah. prior to yes. having seen the movie so that's fantastic in terms of selling the it movie it should be a built-in audience it should be yeah. a built-in audience yeah. mm -hmm. I mean if you veer very far from you know kind of what the heart and soul of the movie is you, you might can turn get, them against you, you <laughs> might get smacked down yeah. exactly but I think that you know about in terms of adaptation, if you're true to the spirit of the movie, sometimes you shouldn't be true to the story. Yeah. You can make a really boring, awful adaptation. Sometimes you have to be true to the... It's a different the, medium. You it's know? a different medium. Sometimes I think that, yeah, you're right. You should talk about where the heart is because that's a great example of, of IP that Susan did brilliant things with. Oh, well, that was like many, many years ago. But um, the book had been published um, I read it in manuscript form, and I kind of tracked it. I had to leave it behind. I was a studio executive at Fox, and I moved to – I set it up there, and I, I moved to a production company that I was building. And um, then I realized I really didn't want to leave it behind, and I was able to get it. I was able to convince um, Lowell Gans and Babalu Mandel to write the – the script to do the adaptation and then um the book and they were a huge get and that, they were like yeah. at the top I mean, of their game they wrote splash yeah they wrote, that they, they've written everything yeah you know they're yeah. they're the yeah. most amazing writers yeah. and really really great men and they wanted to write it because they'd never they they had they had written a bit from a female perspective but they wanted to write it as a love letter to the women in their lives which i thought that was really great and i thought they did a great job of it and again we knew in the first screen the first draft of that screenplay we had a movie but um uh you know the book was so good the voice was so strong and it had been written by billy letts tracy letts mother um who was at the time in her early 50s had never published a book now she had a new york publisher but the book hadn't the book had done really well had gotten great reviews um but hadn't caught fire in an enormous way. Yeah. And so I called my friend Kate Forte, who was running um, Oprah's company. And I said, has Oprah ever read this book? Because it seems like a sure, it seems like an Oprah's book club yeah. selection. And she said, she did read it and she did like it a lot. And I said, would you mind just asking her to think about it again? And she did. And Oprah went, oh, yeah, we'll make it a book club selection. And I'm not sure that was the, you know, the whole process. Yeah. Uh, Kate and Oprah would have to tell us <laughs> exactly what happened behind those doors. But it happened pretty quickly and miraculously. And it changed Billy Lett's life. Billy's no longer with us, sadly. I loved her so much. And her husband, Dennis, they were wonderful, wonderful people. Um, but um, it really changed her life. She went they they did a show in a Walmart that, you know, she became a, a super best-selling author. Yeah. I mean, it just was off the charts. 
And um, she was kind of, you know, fixed for life in, in a really great way, uh, both in terms of, you know, further books and, yeah. uh, you know, it made a big financial impact for her. And so that was, uh, that was, that was amazing. And what it did for the movie is it really put the movie on the map in a yeah. major, major way. Yeah. And within the same calendar year where the heart is, which was based on a book and what women want, which was an original idea were both released. And that put me next to like, Ridley Scott and Jerry Bruckheimer is one of the top grossing producers of the year, which <laughs> has never happened to me since, but it was a very, very, very nice year. thing. The Hollywood yeah. Reporter, uh, you know, made a big to-do about all five of us. So, so great. it was crazy. Amazing. Yeah. Awesome. I guess a question for both of you is how did you decide that this was the path for you of, of becoming producers? Like, how did you, how did you get there? Oh, well, for me, um, I... I thought I was going to work in the book world. I got a master. I moved out to LA to get a master's in English literature. And I thought I was going to work for a literary agent or maybe go to New York and be an editor. And then I, and I just love, I loved film. I love story, but I just, I didn't understand. I didn't realize that, that, that it could be a career. I honestly didn't. It was just a different time. I think people, you know, kids are more aware these days that you can have a career in film, but I, I didn't, I didn't know anyone. I didn't have any family members who were in it. So, but being in LA for school, I looked around and went, Hey, this, let me check this out. And so um, I was told it was a, a great idea to start in an agency, which I, I did. And that's the advice I still give people starting out just to do a year at an agency to try to figure out. I did the same thing. Yeah, really? It's, it's smart. Yeah. It's a good way to we, we always say it's like sort of like the central nervous system of the business. And so it's a great way to learn yeah. very quickly. But um, long story short, um, after I did a year there, I knew I didn't want to be an agent. Um, I started looking and I wanted to I really wanted to work on a film, if possible, for a director or a producer. That was my goal. And it just turned out that Nancy Myers was hiring she, uh, for her assistant for The Parent Trap. It was going to be her first. She had co-written the script, was producing, and was directing for the first time and needed an assistant. So I went in and I um, I interviewed, and um, we got along great, and I got the job. I had never been on a set before. I had no idea what I was doing. I was Tell what? them the detail that got you the job. <laughs> this is funny. One of the things Nancy said uh, that I, the reason I got the job was because the way my resume looked and was organized was how she would do it. So it told her that we sort of thought alike. Oh, interesting. Which I th always thought was interesting. The font was a major And the font. I think it was the font. I think it was the, the layout. It was what I. What font? I, what font I don't remember. Like... I don't remember. But Nancy has excellent taste in fonts. So apparently I do too. And, um, with and the so... with aesthetic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so, um, so yeah. And then I, I mean, I was the first one on the plane to London to get, um, you know, sort of where they were going to be living for the, you know, for the uh -huh. summer ready. And, um, but I had never been on a set before. I didn't know what a grip did. I didn't, I figured it all out. But what I did know was that I loved it and I never wanted to do anything else. Oh and I was like, gosh. I'm, 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 I'm done for. I've got a, this is it for me. So, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I had a that's really awesome. different path. I did do the agency thing. But when I was 12, I directed a movie called, Alice's Nightmare, which covered every social ill that existed that I knew of at the time. And it was structured pretty much like um, The Wizard of Oz. It started in color and moved to black and white differently from <laughs> yeah I, we we recently found a copy of it it's and i have kind of amazing this oh my gosh. This that. anyway one first place at the arizona state university film competition and you were 12 you were 12? And i was 12 <laughs> I, I, I have a picture of me that. standing next to my teacher annalee emory she was amazing and um it it, it was I, I had been a storyteller before that i was constantly putting on plays, taking cardboard boxes and turning them into sets. And um, it, it, storytelling was my whole life and I loved it. And I really thought that I should be because I loved, um, I, I loved sort of constructing the whole story that I should be directing. And so I looked for examples of who was like me, who was directing and I could find Lena Vertmuller. I didn't really understand her movies, but they seemed kind of fun, <laughs> like Roberto Benigni. And then later in my teens, Jillian Armstrong, My Brilliant Career. But I couldn't find anybody in the United States. I'm sure there were a few women who were directing in television. There's nobody 
directing film and there was no real independent cinema at yeah. the time. So I thought, oh, well, the doors are going to be closed to me, but I really like acting and I'd been doing a lot of acting. So I went to UCLA. I studied acting and directing and scenic design and lighting. And I had a really good time. I played Helen Keller in The Miracle Worker mm -hmm. and uh, various other roles. And, and it was a blast. And then I, after graduation, I went to um, work at an agency for about nine months. And I went, okay, I'm not an agent, <laughs> but it was a great place to learn because yeah. you're wedged right in the middle. You're between the artists and the buyers and you you get the landscape of the, the whole industry and you learn the names and you learn right. who does what. I, I remember I, I was allowed into these agency meetings and I worked for the Koner Agency, which was the old European agency run by two um, brothers, Paul Koner, who was an icon, and um, his brother, um, Walter Koner. And um, they were actually, uh, Paul Koner is the grandfather of the Whites brothers. There are, and they had um, all the European stars mm -hmm. would um, be represented by them. So they it was more of a family atmosphere. Um, and so we'd have these meetings. I remember they represented somebody who was Romanian who had a last name that sounded Italian. And so I said, let's put him up for this this job because it was an Italian job. And they said, he's Romanian. And then one of the agents said, but good thought, we'll do it. <laughs> I don't know. And just something that would never happen today because representation is yeah. really important. Yeah. But they figured they could get away with the Romanian versus Italian. I went, oh, well, that teaches me something about the industry, <laughs> what you appear to be, you know, yeah. uh, might be um, entree. But um, so, so I worked there for a while, learned a lot. And then I eventually realized that I – wanted to work with writers because I loved talking to the writers who my boss, Roberta Kent, she was a lit agent, represented. One of her clients was Maxine Hong Kingston, who's this brilliant, brilliant author. And I just get absorbed in her books. Um, I think one of them was called The Woman Warrior. Is, yeah. mm -hmm. And another one of her clients was a man named Wilbert Rideau, who was a black man who was incarcerated in the Louisiana State Penitentiary and had started a literary journal. And he was just such a lovely person. I would talk to him on the phone and I would read his poetry and his uh, his writing and it was inspiring. And then there were, you know, other, other authors who were doing these amazing things, creating, just writing th these amazing things. So I was like, I want to be a writer like them. I'm so inspired by them. Yeah. Do I, I, I want to create? What, what am I going to do? I decided to follow my friend, Robert Friedman. He's, um, he's a writer and a lyricist. He wrote the book for Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder, won the Tony for that, and co-wrote the lyrics. Um, he was going to NYU to grad school. We had met at UCLA, and I had directed um, one of his plays. And um, we used to talk on the phone all the time. And I finally decided I was going to go to NYU to grad school and I was going to study writing. Because one thing I knew, even if I wasn't a writer, I wanted to work with writers. And so that started me on, on a journey. I moved to New York. Um, it was actually a literal and physical journey. I drove there. Um, I ended up um, doing an internship at 20th Century Fox, reading scripts at the tail end of my time there. I loved it. I loved being paid for my opinion. I read scripts. I read, I remember reading A Handmaid's Tale, which was a manuscript. I said, this can never be a movie. It's just too dark. upsetting. <laughs> and dark, but it's I the most. I still agree. I, don't, I can't watch that show. And I said, but it's the most amazing thing I've ever, you know, I loved the writing. It was so amazing. And I loved what it was about. And uh, the other thing I remember that I did recommend strongly was Sleeping with the Enemy, which I said was Hitchcockian. Mm -hmm. And 20th Century Fox took it on and bought it. And I got moved out to LA. I was offered a job as an executive and I became an executive for 10 years. And then from being an executive, it's, it's a short road to yeah. being a producer because you learn some of the same skills, not all yeah. of them. It's much more granular when you're a producer. So anyway, that's yeah. a very, very long answer. Thank you for 
bearing with me no, on that. No, no, that's no it tells it's, it tells part of your journey. It's yeah, an important absolutely. part of your journey. Yeah, it's like one of the things, Susan, that you're very conscious of that I've you know heard over the years is just what a creative producer does. You know, I'd love to kind of talk about that just because I think that there's so like the word producer is thrown around so much like EP producer, mm -hmm. creative line, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of what you do. Can we just talk a little bit about how you approach each project and, and, sure. and what your and can I then for a second before Absolutely. I begin? Absolutely. When I go to produce a movie these days, usually within the first couple of days of showing up, whether it's in Australia or Atlanta or L.A., you hear from the office staff, oh, are you going to come in every day? And it get, it, I start to burn. I feel like <laughs> color coming into my face and I'm like argh, steam coming out of my ears because it really upsets me. Not the question. I'm not upset at the yeah. person, but I'm upset because the perception of producers is that they waft in and out and they're very grand because there's been a devaluation of the mm -hmm. producing yeah. credit. They write a check and, and that's it. That's yeah. or, well, that's an executive producer yeah. job, Gretchen. If somebody writes a check, for 25% or even 50% yeah. of a movie, they're executive producers. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're actually producing yeah. the movie. So when you know the office st staff asks that, then you go, oh, well, there are people who are just phoning it in and taking the credit, and that's wrong. And the Producers Guild tries to stem that, but they don't always succeed. You know, they, yeah. right. they've created the mark. The mark isn't always accurate. Yeah. Um, it, it's not always accurate, but, it, they've they've tried to verify that the person who gets the mark has actually done the work. Sometimes they do, um, most of the time they do, but often mm -hmm. they don't. The the yeah. you know they don't. So that's upsetting because we do work really hard. But we and one of the reasons we're taken for granted uh, is that we try to do our work in an invisible way. Yeah. We support the creative vision of the director. We support all the heads of departments. We hire all of those people. People think that the directors hired everybody or that the studio mm -hmm. hires everybody. That's not really true. Yeah. The the producer does that. We research And we often them. run as con we often act as conduits between the director and the department head if they can't be everywhere all at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know. I I say we are we're like uh, caulking in a bathroom. We hold everything together. But, yeah. but if we're doing our job right, you don't really notice us while we're doing it. Yeah. You know, somebody who's, uh, you know, bringing a lot of attention to themselves is probably not doing the job. The other thing we do is we keep the set safe. Yeah. You know, we pay attention to what kind of job the first AD is doing. And I think a lot of people don't know that the first AD is in charge of safety in some, um, countries and some, um, in, in some places, there's a safety officer as mm. well. In Australia, they always mm. have a safety officer as well. But the first AD is running the set and is responsible for the safety of on the set. And the producers are responsible as well because we're essentially the CEO of yeah. the production. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we bear responsibility. But we keep an eye on everything. You know, if yeah. we see people running as opposed to walking, <laughs> yeah, you know, running. No, absolutely. or we hear a lot but of you're also, you're also like the, from some of the stories that, you know, we've talked about, you're also like the good guy and the bad guy. You're like the good cop and bad cop across all of your films. And that's also stressful as the CEO. It's like, those are hard decisions to make. Well, we have to fire, you yeah. know, and unlike in a regular corporation, we fire fast yeah. because there's no time to correct behavior. Somebody comes in to do a job. They're either ready to do that job or they're not ready to do right. the job yeah. and they have to gather more experience or maybe they'll never be ready. You know, there are people yeah. who are not meant to be in, in the film industry, mm -hmm. but, but oftentimes somebody's not quite ready yet. If that's the case, then you have to, you have swiftly. to you have to move yeah. swiftly. There's not time. Yeah. We don't have time to. You know, it's not pleasant when that happens, but it yeah. does happen, and you have to sort of I, fire early. Is yes. is what I say. Yeah. And yeah. I, yeah. you know, I teach producing, and I, I'm it's a true. big proponent of that. It's yeah. not fun. Yeah. I don't. I don't like making somebody unhappy or hurting somebody's feelings. No. But I, I work for the movie. That's right. Yeah. I don't work for the studio. I don't work for the director. I work for the movie, right. and. I want to make sure that the movie is going to be good and intact yeah. Yeah. and that everybody's going to be safe. Will you talk a little bit about your teams that, you, uh, that you've that you worked with and the teams that you put together and what you look for? Are they, you know, do you mix and match? Are they, the, do you have a same core group? Talk about those teams because it's, I mean, it's very important. 
I mean, certainly it's a different group on every movie. Um, but I think when you find good people, you want to hire them every time if mm -hmm. you can. You know, it's tricky because sometimes, you know, you're you're in a, you're in Canada or you're in Australia. You can't always hire the same people. You know, it's not that you you might want to hire someone that's done great work for you. But um, I like it to be a combination. Yeah. Because I love working with people I've successfully worked with before. And new people. It's just yeah. so comforting yes. to have that anchor. Yeah. But I really like meeting new people. Me yeah. And every film set is like a new family that you're putting together mm -hmm. and it's going to have a different dynamic and it's going to create different things and it's going to be exciting in a different way. So I kind of love having new people and I love the combination of newer, fresher, less experienced, more experienced. I also think it's really important to have a lot of inclusion. I want a huge number of women. I want people of every color and every culture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as many different yeah. cultures and colors as possible, because I think it makes for a richer on-screen experience and it's the right thing to do. And it's the way to change the industry because if you give yeah. people experience, then yeah. they can take the bigger job next time. Yeah. So, you know, in the situations where we know that we're going to have a white male director of photographer, d photography, we talk to that DP and we yeah. say, we really want you as you hire your team yeah. to focus on women and people of color, we want a diverse team. That is of huge value to us. And if you, and we give you permission to take a chance on somebody. Yeah. yeah. How do you find the new talent? It's like, we've, you know, in terms of finding some of the folks that you're giving them their first chance or their second chance on, on a film or on a set, how do you find those folks? Like, how do they bubble up to you? It's different. It's, it's I mean, sometimes it's through agents, sometimes it's through friends. Some, you know, people are recommended, like, I know they don't have the resume, maybe it doesn't look, but trust me, you take a chance on that person. Uh, how long? Most of the diverse um, department heads that I've worked with are really generous and helpful to other people of color who are coming up. Yeah. So it does make a lot of sense to talk to, I would say, both women and people of color or women of color, yeah. because... Um, as, as women, we tend to be more inclusive and we're looking to, because we've systematically been shut out. You know, I know, I know that that's been my experience, even though I've been very fortunate in a lot of ways. So I really try to help people who are looking to break in, particularly people who have no relatives and no um, friends who are in the industry, which was my situation mm -hmm. yeah. and your situation mm -hmm. too. We had to forge our own way and that's hard. And, um, so, you know, we try to, we're not Nepo babies. No, <laughs> <laughs> we are not. We are so not. Um, but, um, and then also if you work on movies of different sizes, you have different levels of freedom to take chances. So, mm. uh, I made a movie called Dieter and Laney rob a train. And that movie was going to be diverse because our um, financier, Netflix, specifically said they wanted to make a super girl power diverse movie. Now, my director, Sydney Freeland, is super diverse. And um, the um, but the cast who she originally was going to cast was going to be pretty much all white. And then we talked to the studio and they said, no, Sydney, you may be a diverse choice, but we want people of color in this movie. So we mixed it up and we, um, there was no reason that the movie couldn't be cast diversely. And there was no intense pressure to cast huge movie stars because the movie only cost $2 million. Yeah. So, um, I said to the person I was producing with a guy named Nick Masser, I said, why don't we make behind the scenes, and no pressure from Netflix about this um, at the time. Their indie division was very, very young at the time, and they really gave us freedom. They said, why don't we make what's behind the camera match what's in front of the camera? Because I thought, you know, our cast will feel really happy, will feel really happy, and let's see how that, since we have the freedom to hire people who are newer yeah. is a perfect opportunity. So he found um, Qian Tran, who's a female Asian 
DP. She's now going to direct, but she was doing a lot of DPing. She hadn't really done much comedy. She was brilliant. She was amazing. And we just like uh, our costume designer, uh, designer, Sierra, she just, uh, she stepped into much bigger roles uh, as costume designer. Now she just did her movie for Amazon, Sitting in Bars with Well, that's Kate. a great example of, that's Susan had worked with her on Deidre and Laney and yeah. recommended her for Sitting in Bars with Kate, and she did a great job. And she had like two cents yeah. to work with yeah. on Deidre and Laney, and she just worked miracles and, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, we were shooting in Salt Lake City. Some of our crew were um, many of uh, many of our sort of working crew were uh, white guys, you know, uh, as they will be in Salt Lake. And they said it was the happiest film set they'd ever been on. Now, a two million dollar <laughs> film should in shooting in the summer when it's damn hot in Salt Lake City. They shouldn't be that happy. They shouldn't be that happy. <laughs> <laughs> and yet they were. And I chalk that up to the um, just the yeah, inclusion yeah, no, of what was going on behind the scenes and the fact that people were working so, I don't know, um, yeah. with such such a good feeling. You know, there was just a good vibe. Mm -hmm. That happened on Carrie Pilby too. It was just like a very low budget. You find people kind of come together and sort of feel a part of it and feel – they kind of give you their best. Yeah. The uh -huh. DP. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. So. So can we gush? I know we don't have a ton of time left, but we want to gush on all of your films that you've worked on. Oh my God. Well, sure. Like, like, <laughs> <laughs> we blush. like I was going to say, like, Susan, like, obviously I have a 10 year old and she is your biggest fan. Yeah. I say Susan Carsonis in my house and Alicia's like, like what? Right. <laughs> what is she doing now? <laughs> like, she adores you. Aww. you know, it's like us with Aquamarine. How many like, times can we watch yeah, Aquamarine? Yeah, right? we the dub, everything. Aww, feel oh, the yeah. beat. Uh, you know, oh, you've done amazing. so many. It's like, is that a passion of yours? What the I'm just doing like why like you've done some yes. amazing like Yes, because I for mean, young women. because I'm like uh I want, I believe in social change. And I think if you can get into the, don't tell anybody. <laughs> Even if we're a on a master podcast. manipulator. <laughs> but if you can get into the minds of the young ones and entertain them and help them form good ideas about what the world should be, I think you can yeah. change the world. You know, in Aquamarine, there were a lot of ideas that the director, Liz Allen, and I had. One of them was we didn't want to sell girls a lot of brands. Yeah. So we mm -hmm. created the idea of a T-shirt that turns into a dress that can be worn in a lot of different ways. And that's something that I'd done mm -hmm. with T-shirts mm -hmm. when I was a kid. But we didn't want it to be, oh, it's Chanel or, you know. Yeah. And yeah. when they went shopping, you notice they went to a thrift sh mm -hmm. shop. Yeah. And Aquamarine, who was a magical, creative creature, showed them how to turn ugly old things into beautiful yeah. new things, repurpose, which is also sustainability. I mean, that stuff has slipped in, but it's also fun. We make it fun, you know. Yeah. You don't want it to be feel medicinal. It, yeah. it needs to right. be entertaining too. Right. Yeah. No, so, yeah, I love it. And I also think it's a really important age. And I know, you know, when movies were focused on me when I was a kid, when they were about people mm. who looked like me, yeah. it meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. So I want to do yeah. the same. When they stand the test of time, I mean, oh, those yeah. movies do. They just are still. Say, Alicia was maybe six or seven when she saw Freaky Friday. And then all of a sudden she was like, what else has she done? <laughs> it was like, and I came oh my over, gosh. she was like yeah. gone through yeah. them. Like it's very yeah. like no, they, sweet they do fangirl. Aww. So, and you've worked on some incredible blockbusters too. <laughs> like in terms of the intern, it's complicated. I remember the first time I met you, I just sat there in awe. <laughs> we had lunch. I was like, oh my God, I'm girl crushing. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you said that. That was cute. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was really just fortunate working with Nancy and, and, um, She's a brilliant writer and those, those, you know, her scripts right. attract the best actors. And so I've just been really fortunate to, to work on those films that, um, with such brilliant actors, you know, watching Nancy do her thing, which was like, you know, incredible. And, um, and watching the impact that they've, those films have had and how they're so beloved is really, it's really gratifying for me. It, those movies were, you know, a lot of fun to make, but, um, it's really, it's nice to hear how how much people enjoy them and watch them for comfort. And yeah. especially like we we're just have just come out of the holiday season and it's also the holiday yeah. season because yeah. everybody yeah. gets so many DMS and um, Nancy and I were texting about, you know, how much she hears from uh, people, how much 
they love the movie The Holiday, especially at the holidays. You well, have the, to, there was yeah. a rumor that it that you guys were going to do the holiday too, that and it was going like viral, it wasn't and true. she had to like she had to, oh, shut, it down. She had to shut it down. Yeah. I know people like, were very disappointed, but, but. Um, yeah. So um, and it's great. Yeah, it's it's really it feels really good that that um, that those movies stand the test of time also, and I think yeah. we'll be. Like both of you have like have iconic movies that are going to be in people's lives in the next generation. And well, one of like the that's, fun that's things incredible. about being older is <laughs> it and having been in the business for so long yeah. is that you see generationally how people have been affected. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get a letter 10 years later. Sometimes you bump into people who are now adults who saw Aquamarine when they were a kid yeah. or, you know, or, or Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which I was an executive on. And they say it got oh. me through high school. I was really down and mm -hmm. it got me through because and it's about superpowers. And to specify, it's the Luke Perry one. <laughs> it's the Luke Perry one. Rest in peace. Yeah. It, it, because it was about being pretty and powerful. Yeah. And it was mm -hmm. about having superpowers that even you don't know about. Yeah. And I think we all need to know that we've got those superpowers and we're going to come into our own. And especially when you're a teen and things are so hard, yeah. you know, so, so it's really gratifying to hear about it, mm -hmm. to hear how those are dividends that yeah. pay off over time in such a profound way. It feels really good. You have a big slate coming up in, over the we course do. of the next couple of years. Like how do you pick your projects and which ones are you looking most forward to doing? I think they're all kind of our darlings, aren't they? But but we they we always pick us. they pick us, and we always <laughs> say it's a horse race. Well, it's very interesting. We thought there was a movie going. I would say we thought there was a ninety eight percent chance it was yeah. going in late spring summer in Vancouver. We just found out no, nope, it's going. They want to make it next year, and we'll have to take this year to develop the script. And then there was another one that we thought was going independently, and then we got sort of a not a great email this morning that, yeah. you know, that, so, so, so we thought those two were going and then it's just like the rug gets pulled out from under you, but now we're pushing these other few of ahead and, you know, so it's yeah. like, we always say it's like a horse race. It and really by is. the you way, when you get the devastating news, like we did this morning, you go, okay, so that path is closed or likely closed. What's the oh, other path? We had another path. That's right. We're going to pursue that full, okay. full steam ahead. You know, that, that just has to be. Producing is just not giving up. <laughs> It's true. It's true. Like, talk about the different roles, like writing and directing and producing, and how do you do you like doing different things? Do you like, <laughs> nah, at this point, I'm just going to produce or writing? I know you've been. So, how do you guys? Yeah, you know, how do you I feel always, about those different roles? I mean, for me, I always thought um, just having such a front row seat to what Nancy did and and the way I worked with her, I always thought I'd like to direct. I'd like to do that, and I directed a lot of second unit on those movies and. Um, so I feel, and I, and I just feel comfortable. I feel like it's the time to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. And I, I just decided I'm not going to, when I decided I wanted to do that, I was like, well, I'm not going to sit around and wait for a great script to come along because I know how long that takes. And so I decided I would try, I would write one. And I, I have this great, um, uh, collaborator, um, Gabriel Mizrahi, who I write with and, um, and yeah. And so it's just been a sort of an organic process because I wanted, to, you know, um, to develop something to direct. So that's without going into too much detail. That's yeah, that's definitely yeah. in, the, in the in the cards and 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 part of the plan. That's See if very it exciting. So it's amazing how many producers we talk to that started out with writing either with a literary agent being an assistant mm -hmm. or or with writing kind of as their plan and moved into producing. That's mm -hmm. that seems to happen a lot. There are different kinds of producers. You know, the line, the great line producers of the world who I who are absolutely invaluable to every movie um, often come up through more technical filmmaking, mm -hmm. accounting. Um, but the really great line producers are storytellers too. So they're, li they're also genius listeners. You know, they mm -hmm. listen to the creative people on the production, including the creative producers um, to get a sense of what the, the important aspects of the storytelling are so that if a decision has to be made, a financial or technical decision, or there's an emergency on set and you have to leave something behind, which often happens, they'll be you know, in step with the creative team in terms of helping make that decision, both financially mm -hmm. and creatively. What are the priorities? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the um, line producer job is also a creative storytelling job and they are mm -hmm. often really good storytellers. They know that the story has to link together logically in order to deliver the movie. So, 
you know, you need somebody mm-hmm. who understands the the way that the, the logic unfolds yeah. in the story. Otherwise, yeah. you're, you're not really serving the movie well. And right. the creative producer is not the only guardian of that. You have to work together. It's like we always say all creative has a cost. They're not separate things. You know, mm-hmm. it's, yeah. it's it's you have to work together. Sometimes but, studios try to keep you apart yeah, it's not or healthy. pit you against each other. And when that happens, I say, hey, you're talking to the wrong producer here or working with the wrong producer. I don't work that way. I work... Uh, in collaboration with, and I don't have secrets from my line producer, and I expect my line producer isn't going to have secrets from me. That's right. We're a team, and so don't try to work yeah. one against the other. Mm-hmm. I guess uh, you know there are, you know, teams that come together who hide things from each other. Uh, so I don't know. It doesn't yeah. make sense. Yeah. It's yeah. not. Yeah. It's not a great way to manage. Yeah. You know, that's not. That's not my mm-hmm. my way mm-hmm. i won't work that way no. yeah same <laughs> when you guys are starting a project or or in the middle of a project and most i, I don't want to say most i don't know this the answer to this if they're um like a narrative film uh, a one or a series uh, do you do you look at that process do you have something where you're looking at a script and you're like i know this is a two-hour movie and that's what it is yes. or do you say oh this could be a it just happened yesterday okay yeah. so you could say no yeah. this is a four four part series is yeah. that does a that member of our team uh had his heart set on something as a movie and Suzanne read it and she goes this is a limited series okay this it was a it, book. It was a book. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, the format really affects how successful a project yeah. can be. You have to think about where does this live? Where where will this really succeed? You mm-hmm. know, what will make it, you know, what will make it amazing? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and who and if you're with Netflix or with a studio, they're open to that of of we thought this was a movie, but now it's a series, or does that do you we really would take it to the appropriate division? We if okay, we it was after film, we take it there. If we thought it was T V we would Okay, take it so to, you yeah. have to decide that before yeah. you're before going Not in. That it couldn't you could I, I guess there's sometimes you that could happens. pivot. You could say, you yeah. know, it, it could change. There's, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I feel like there's just again so much flexibility now with yeah. the streamers and with the different, you know, mm-hmm. all the all the different places that things can go that Yeah. Well, there's so much excellent work being done in the one hour series uh, Mm -hmm. Uh vein, and that wasn't something that really existed in a major way. The limited series was not a thing. Yeah. You know, it Mm -hmm. was a thing in Europe. (laughs) They they had them there. But now, thank God, they exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's more fun than binging a limited series? It's because you can go, we were saying yesterday, the, the reason the characters in this book were quite well drawn and. But it was a lot of it was in, you, you just would need to go deep. You just can't go that deep in a you, that the, yeah. as deep as you would need to for this material um, in a feature. So you just go much. You, you just yeah. get to know the characters more. You know, right. Deeper. Right. Yeah. Right. There's nothing worse than watching something be like, don't end. Yeah. No, I need it. You yeah. need more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, I know we are out of time. Out of time. It's that was fast. I it know. really went fast. Thank you for <laughs> yeah, having us. So you. We are so excited to have you guys on. I know, and I can't believe I, I've never heard your origin story after all that. Like I didn't know that meet that your meet cute. I That's love so it. Yes. yes. After all this time, I didn't know you were Charlie. Sorry. Charlie to her angel. <laughs> <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode, subscribe and leave a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. To stay up to date with In Her Words, join the conversation by following Women in Entertainment on our social channels and subscribe to our weekly newsletter at womeninentertainment.com.